Hello everyone and welcome to the Horse.com's webinar on the recent equine herpes virus 1 outbreak, What Horse Owners Need to Know, brought to you free by InterVet Shearing Plow Animal Health. Visit them online at www.intervetusa.com. I'm Christy West, digital editor and producer for the Horse.com, and joining us today to present the latest on this very hot topic are Dr. Paul Morley, Professor and Section Head for Population Health in the Department of Clinical Sciences in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Colorado State University, and their Director of Biosecurity for their Veterinary Teaching Hospital. We also have Dr. Craig Barnett, Senior Equine Te Technical Services Veterinarian for InterVet Shearing Plow Animal Health. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I'm going to make my presentation here rather short because I think it's very important that we get to the uh, core of the of the issue, and that is uh, Dr. Morley's presentation with regards specifically to the outbreak, but just a little bit of uh, background with regards to equine herpes virus infection. Uh, it is a herpes virus closely related to virus that causes cold sores in people. Uh, with the horse, two primary viruses that cause problems in the herpes family, one is herpes virus 1, the other herpes virus 4. Herpes virus 1 causes abortions and it causes respiratory disease and neurological disease, of course, which we are our primary focus of this evening. That neurological disease is also called, also called equine herpes virus myeloencephalopathy. Uh, equine herpes virus 4 is primarily associated with respiratory disease, generally in younger individuals. Uh, classic respiratory symptoms, nasal discharge, fever, uh, sometimes cough, and that sort of thing. Rarely ESV4 causes abortions. Uh, epidemiological features of this virus and this disease in horses, we do see subclinical infections in horses, meaning that the horses are infected with the virus, the virus is in their system, but they don't show clinical disease. The hallmark, one of the hallmarks of herpes viruses in all species, and also in the horse, is a condition called latency. What this means is that the primary route of infection is, is nasal to inhalation of the virus. The virus goes back to the back of the throat replicates and then it goes to the lymph nodes, eventually ends up inside the white blood cells, circulates throughout the body inside the white blood cells, and that's called viremia, virus in the bloodstream, virus in the white blood cells. During that phase of infection, the virus can hide out in the horse's system and hide out in the white blood cells and also in the, the bundle of, of nerve cells and essentially evade the horse's immune system. So this latency is essentially a persistent infection of the virus in the horse's system, whereas the virus is able to hang out and evade the horse's immune system. Uh, when the horse gets infected, and most horses become infected early in life, when they get infected, short-lived protection after infection, and uh, generally about two to three months of protection after infection. There is, does seem to be an age-related increase in duration of, immu of immunity, primarily with regards to the respiratory form of the disease. Uh, abortion, the neurological form, as you will see, does not have an age-related component as far as protection goes. Okay, so infection in populations of horses we see, with that latent infection, what happens is, so it's, it's worth noting that the majority of horses are latently infected. I mean, uh, I thought uh, Dr. Lund put it well earlier when he says that uh, having EHV, equine herpes virus infection, is part of the life of being a horse, part of being a horse. So these horses become latently infected. Again, the virus hangs out in the white blood cells, evades the immune system. Periodically, there's reactivation of the latent infection. With reactivation, the horse sheds virus. When that horse is shedding virus, it's common to infect a young horse. This is what, how we think horses, most of the horses are infected at a very young age, probably days to weeks to months of age they become infected for the first time. Then again, the, then, the, then the virus has established itself in a new host and we have a horse that has latency. During periods of stress and other times throughout the horse's body, horse's life, I'm sorry, these, this virus can reactivate again or recrudesce and start shedding virus again. When you talk about disease with uh, equine herpes virus, again, the primary route of transmission is through direct contact. It also can be aerosol. It also can be indirect contact through fomites, buckets, uh, hands, and that sort of thing. But anyway, the virus enters the nasal cavity, goes to the upper respiratory tract of the naive host. It replicates, as I indicated, 
in the lymphoid tissue at the back of the throat, and then it establishes latency inside the white blood cells where we have the leukocyte-associated viremia, bullet point number three there, leukocyte being the white blood cells. From there, these virus-infected cells can go different, different uh, places in the body. There seems to be an affinity for the placenta in pregnant mares where it goes to the placental tissue, and we get uh, inflammation of the placenta, and essentially what this does is these virus-infected white blood cells attached to the what, what are called endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. We get an inflammation of the blood vessels or a vasculitis, which causes blood clots and, and causes compromise to the uh, blood supply to the uterus and subsequently abortion. These are generally late-term abortions in pregnant mares caused by equine herpes virus 1. In the neuro neurological situation, the same thing happens except it goes to the nervous tissue, the central nervous tissue in the brain. We get the virus infecting the endothelial sites, lining the blood vessels. Again, a vasculitis or inflammation of the blood vessels, uh, blood clots, and essentially what we have in the situation of the neurological disease is just similar to a mini stroke due to the vascular compromise from the virus infecting the lining of the blood vessels. Next, we, we thought it would be important to talk to you a little bit about um, what we know about this outbreak. Um, many of you, the first things you may have heard about it were an update from your, from your um, fellow uh, horse owners or from your breed associations or from the state veterinarian's office, and it may not be totally clear about, about what the circumstances um, that happened. So we're going to talk just a little bit about that. Um, this event, um, the best that we can tell, uh, based upon uh, reports of disease, uh, occurred around uh, a horse uh, cutting competition that happened in Ogden, Utah, uh, during the the last little bit of April and and the beginning of May. And there were over 300 horses that were at that event uh, entrance anyway. There are more horses than that uh, that were at the at the arena. Um, this was an invitational event, a, a national western region final, and so uh, as you can imagine there for an event of this size and, and of its significance, there were cutting horses from throughout the western United States and western Canada that were invited to come and participate for this and they all came to Ogden in a very short period of time. Based upon um, the occurrence of disease uh, that's happened in the horses that were at that event, um, we assume, we, know, we, we don't have absolute confirmation, but we assume that a horse was probably incubating uh, an EHV1 or a herpes virus 1 infection, and then while it was at that event, it started shedding the virus. Um, we don't know exactly which horse this was. We don't know um, how the horses got exposed. There's a lot of uncertainties about this. And that's typical, actually, of trying to do a trace back on an outbreak of this sort. We know kind of, we often can know um, uh, how horses might have been exposed, but we don't know all of the details. It doesn't look like there were any kinds of negligence that went on, and there were um, obviously the, the organizers and the veterinarians and the host owners were very concerned about the horses that were at that event. But as, as it happened, uh, the horses that were exposed to the virus during that show, um, they, were, they returned to their homes and went, or went on to other competitions, as was the case for some horses that went on to a, uh, another cutting, major cutting event in, in Bakersfield, California and before we understood that there were some infections that had occurred. Horses that left that event uh, were distributed as far as we know to uh, at least 20 western states and provinces and all these circles are trying to represent here is just the widespread distribution of horses asked after they left that Ogden show not necessarily how many horses went to went to a particular place. Using information that uh, has been provided uh, and by the state veterinarians and, and provincial veterinarians in the, in the various uh, regions uh, that has also been that has been collated by the USDA uh, APHIS offices. Um, we believe that as of uh, midnight last night that there were uh, confirmed cases or suspect cases in 15 of those 20 states and provinces, and, and you can see how widespread that is. Now it's important to note that not 
all of the uh, exposures that we're talking about, not all of the disease occurrences happened in the horses that were in Ogden. Some of those happened in um, horses that were on the premises where the horses that attended the Ogden competition went to after they left the horse show.